Welcome to the Midlife and Beyond podcast with Joe Blackwell, where we're changing the narrative on ageing one story at a time. Did you know that the proportion of people going self-employed over 50 is growing year on year, both here in the UK and in the US? This week, I'm talking to Colleen Kohanek, who teaches midlife women how to launch an online business. Hi, Colleen. Hey, Joe. How are you doing? I'm really good, thank you. And I'm really interested to talk to you about this. Why do you think that so many women over 50 are starting businesses? Oh, gosh. How long do we have? I think there's a lot of reasons, Joe. I think for starters, you know, our generation, I'm, I'll be 57 next week. We are coming to terms with the fact that we have a whole nother life ahead of us. We could have 20, 30 years ahead of us. And they're very good years. It's not like when our grandparents were our age and they became, you know, older and, you know, their health declined, et cetera, that, you know, we're living so much longer. And what's happening that I'm finding is women are kind of getting to this stage like myself, like, oh my gosh, I haven't planned for this next act. What am I going to do? And the challenge is we haven't necessarily saved enough money to take us well through the next two or three decades doing all the things we want to do, as well as we're also not willing just to settle down and do nothing. It's, I see very much this kind of movement towards, it's my turn. It's my turn now. I've done like a whole life of being an employee, being a wife, being, a, you know, all the things, the, you know, typical kind of female roles that have gone before. And now, you know, we have so much opportunity and women are like, nope, it's my turn. What the heck am I going to do? And they, they don't just want to maybe sit around and play bridge and, you know, no disrespect for that. But a, a lot of people in my audience are like, I don't want to not do, I, I want to do something, something meaningful. Yeah. yeah. Well, we want purpose in our lives, don't we? And the first half of life is about accumulating and climbing our careers and bringing up our families. And, and then we get to a point, you've got all those things, you know, if, if you've, if you've gone that path. And actually, then you start giving them all away. You start decluttering. You start sort of simplifying things. We were talking earlier about simplifying our businesses, weren't we? You know, we don't want all the noise around everything, but we also want purpose. We want a reason to get up in the morning and and to reach out to others. Yeah, absolutely. And I find a lot of people, because a lot of the consensus is, oh, when we get to a certain age, we retire, we can volunteer, we can do some of these things. I find a lot of women in my audience are like, I've already given so much of my time, so much away. I really want to do something for me now. And I want it to be valued as much as valuable. So I find that a lot. Yeah. And, you know, being paid for what you do. I I have women that say like, I know this sounds awful, but I don't want to volunteer my time. Like (laughs) I care for everybody else. Yeah. Yeah. My time's precious. You know, Uh, yes, I'm hoping I've got another 30 years, you know, I'm 62 and I hope I've got another 30 decent years ahead of me, you know, if I'm lucky, but I don't want to spend that time, as you say, playing bridge, sitting and reading. I'm quite like, you know, doing things more slowly, doing things my way, but I also want to create something and really give voice to that creativity that we all feel. There's like a creative surge when you go through midlife. I don't dampen that down. Yeah, that's a really good point. We do get to an age, menopause, post-menopause, where we do kind of have that creative surge again. And I know a lot of people in my audience, they, they want to self-actualize all, all these things that they have accumulated, you know, interests, skills, passions, hobbies, you know, just really, they get really good at stuff and they haven't necessarily been able to act on all those things for, Mm -hmm. for many decades because they've had other responsibilities. And now it's like the opportunity, like I get to create something, you know, that's absolutely mine. But you bring up a good point too. We also don't want to be in that hustle culture anymore. We want something slower. So I think a lot of women are turning to online businesses because of the flexibility of it. Mm. Before we talk about the vehicle for the businesses and, and an online work, there's also the other reason that a lot of women are still working is they maybe haven't saved for pensions or they've had life events like divorce, bereavement and so on that has left them financially in a bit of a pickle 
and this is uh, one way, isn't it, of of taking back control of our financial health. Yes, a one hundred percent. I mean, I I don't know about the UK, but in the US, you know, we have our social security system that. I don't think you could really live on social security alone. And, you know, the percentage of people who don't have significant savings, certainly not if you have another 30 years, uh, they don't have, you know, enough savings for that. And so the, you know, the fear of poverty or just not having enough money is, is a real one for sure, for sure. And also if we're going to be doing all these things in, in this gifted time that we now have in our generation these things cost money if we want to go on these adventures and and, you know we want to do all these things we need to be able to fund it as well so we're going to be forced uh, into those uh, more sedentary opportunities well I often say like we need financial peace of mind and we have to fund the fun because (laughs) it costs money it costs money to travel or you know do whatever it is you want to do it costs money yeah. Do you find that the women in your audience, I know that in, in mine, adventure is a really big thing. Things like wanting to climb a mountain or do a trail or, or to push themselves outside their comfort zone is exciting at, at this time in our lives. And again, that costs money. It does cost money. And I, I think it also goes back to we haven't necessarily had the opportunity or time to do those things because of other responsibilities. So now we want to do it. You know, we push so much off, but when I retire, when I retire, I'll do this. Well, now is the time, of course, to do those things, but you have to have the money and the inclination to do it. Of course, by the time we get to this time in our lives, we've learned so many things. We all have something, don't we, that we can teach and that we can share. And the sharing of wisdom now is such a driver and the world needs that wisdom and that experience so it would be such a shame not to create these things that that women in your audience are creating and share them with the world and share them with younger people the the question is how do we do that now you said earlier that uh, a lot of women are going online and creating online businesses. And this is where you come in, isn't it? Because you teach them how to create online businesses. Yeah, and I'm so glad you brought this point up because one of my superpowers is finding other people's superpowers. Because one thing I find that makes me very mad and sad are I get women in my audience and they'll be like, I don't have anything to offer. And I'm like, it is 1000% impossible that you have spent more than five decades on this planet and you don't have amazing monetizable assets to, you know, just to sell and turn into a business and to share. But I think as women, we've been so programmed. I mean, that could be a whole other conversation that, you know, we, we devalue ourselves. And so I love to get with women and just start digging like, well, I have my digging through the decades. It's when I see my shirt, (laughs) I'm like, we're digging through your decades because I guarantee there's so much wisdom there that can be monetized. And the interesting thing about coming online with it is all of your skills and interests can kind of be combined or mashed up to make very unique businesses that's not necessarily uh, possible or as easy in an on-ground business. So, you know, that could look something like, I've been a bookkeeper my whole career, but I also love dogs and dog walking. Why not start, you know, bookkeeping for dog walkers, an online course or online program? So there's a lot of ways to combine kind of seemingly unrelated things into a business to make something very unique. And another great thing about it is, you know, there's no such thing as a new idea. So I often have women like, oh, but everybody's doing what I want to do. Like we were talking about decluttering earlier. Well, there are many people out there teaching decluttering, but we just have to find your secret sauce to that. And in the online space, it's really easy just to make very interesting combinations and and make it into a monetizable asset or course or consultancy or whatever it happens to be. So yeah, I love love that you bring that up because it it is impossible that you don't have something to sell. I mean, it's a brave new world, isn't it? Digital courses and, and things like that. And I don't think it occurs to a lot of us that we do have those kind of monetizable skills in the online space. We know that we've got transferable skills into the job market and so on. But I think an awful lot of women 50 plus don't, it doesn't occur to them that they could actually draw it all together like that. And I think your yeah. superpower is a, is a super one to be able to talk to somebody and then draw out what their special skills are. 
I mean, they've, they've got to yeah. hit them before they start, haven't they? <laughs> yeah, they have. Or I often get to, they either don't believe that they have skills to sell or I'll get what I call the curse of the competent. Like nobody would want that. Like everybody knows that. I'm like, no, <laughs> no, they don't. You know it. And it doesn't seem like a valuable skill to you because it's something you've done for so long. It's just such a, an inherent part of your life that you don't see it as a skill, but not everybody has that skill. But it, I see that a lot as well. They just don't recognize it as something valuable. Do you find that also you, you get this sort of block of, well, if I'm going to go into business for myself, it's a 40 hour week. I've got to employ loads of people. I've got to spend out loads of money. The uh, corporate KPIs, you know, your key performance indicators and so on, you don't actually have to take those with you. You can create a business that suits you and your lifestyle and the amount of time you want to spend. With my business, I've set it up in such a way because I want to be an active part in my grandchildren's lives as well. That to me is just as important but I don't certainly don't want to give up all these wonderful things. You can set something up that suits you. This is my point. And that's where the online space is so good. There's so many possibilities out there. And you touched on something there when you were talking about your lady, you know, dog walking and doing bookkeeping for dog keepers. That's a really quite a deep niche, isn't it? And that's the key because we think that we've got to be everything to everybody. So if you were working as an accountant or what have you, and maybe you're an accountant for, I don't know, solicitors or something like that, but it's not usual in real life. <laughs> I'm not saying online yeah. isn't real life, but um, in the, the bricks and mortar businesses to go so far into a niche as you can. In And once you've got a niche, then your marketing is so much easier. Yes. And it is, I get a lot. I mean, a few things you touched on. I do a lot of kind of helping my audience like, change their perspective on business because we do come with this kind of on ground perspective. Like if I start a business, I need an office and people and employees and, you know, all the things. And I'm like, no, no, this is online. Like you don't, you know, we're just going to get you, you know, a nice little tool online and it'd be easy. I love the, the flexibility of the niching because, or I should say the efficiency of niching because the more that you niche down in the online space, like you said, it's so much easier to market and find your exact people. And it always feels a little counterintuitive. Like you said, everybody wants to be everything for everybody. Oh, I can sell more. And in fact, you won't, you'll sell far less. But the cool thing about online is you reach the entire world potentially, you know, with the click of a button. And so you are able to find you know, whatever, you know, however niched you are, I guarantee you'll find plenty of people out there with the same interest or the same need, uh, which is, I think, where the real opportunity comes in. Uh, mm -hmm. And with tools now, I have become a huge fan of this new new tool called Stand Store that is such an easy tool because tech can be a hurdle to getting online because it can be complicated, lots of moving parts. And it's just a very simple tool that you can set up in 30 minutes, like literally. And that that's what I teach my people in now because you don't even have to have a website or custom domains or it just kind of removes all of that preliminary angst around the technology part. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Because you've talked before, you came on the podcast a few years ago now and you've talked about the fact that we're digital immigrants, not digital natives. Do you want to just explain what you mean by that? Yes. So digital immigrants, I always say, if you remember typing class, you are a digital immigrant. And that simply means, and these are real terms that we use in technology and user experience. It simply means technology came to us during our lives versus younger people who have never not known technology. I always use the analogy, like little kids today, like they're born teething on their mom's iPad you know, you and I were born like sucking on mom's car keys. Like, you know, it was just a different, it's a different world. Technology came to us, but what we've learned watching people, you know, use technology, we approach technology very differently because coming from the typing generation, when we started hitting buttons, we had consequences. Like once you started committing that thing to the piece of paper, we had consequences. We had to think it through. We had to plan it. We had to do all of these things because we did not have copy, paste, delete, clone, you know, all the things that just make it so easy now. 
And so our brains are just not wired the same when we approach technology. And it can become a real hurdle when somebody wants to do an online business. And then the first thing they have to do is a complicated tech activity, like getting a domain and getting it verified. And it, you know, it just, it, it's too much, it's too much. And so, and people don't want to be, you know, tech, tech people. Like we want to do our thing that we want to do in our business. We don't want to spend our lives learning all of these apps and tools, but it is a, it is a part of it. Uh, having a business, but fortunately, there are more and more tools out there that really are for non-techie people. Because uh, there's a lot of tools that will say, "Oh, it's it's great for non-techie people," but I'm like, "But those, that's not us. They're not talking about us. They're talking about younger non-techies. They're not talking about us because they can still be complicated." So new tools like a stand store is incredible. It's a great opportunity. Mm. Yeah, I mean, you talk about us pressing buttons I think that's really interesting because even in the times of when, when we first got to video recorders and so on you know and, and the, the joke was wasn't it or you get your grandchildren or your children to set up the video thing and I used to watch them doing things like if I, I set up a new computer or something and they would just I'd go well, can you help me with this because I'm plowing my way through a manual that thick trying to work out what to do because that's what you we did didn't we we read things we read the manuals and they're going why what are you reading that for just just try it just you know click this click that but I used to think well I'll break it you know something will... yeah. and that's exactly why isn't it because you know yes. I don't have that much tip yet tip x <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it came to us, you know, when technology came into our life, it was very clunky. I mean, remember the first computers and the big card thingies, and it was very different and we didn't have as much access to it. And when you got access to tech, it was like a big deal. Like, oh my gosh, you're going to use the computer kind of thing. And so we just don't instinctively know, like kids today know, oh, click the three lines up in the right-hand corner for the menu, click the little cog wheel, like for the settings, they just instantly know that we're, we're like, wait, what, where, what, where is it? I always remember when I first started my business and I was doing a course and everybody's like, do Facebook live. It's really great. People love that. I'm like, okay, where's the button? <laughs> where's the damn button? You know, yeah. I, I didn't see the button that was big red button right there in the middle of my phone. I'm like, where's the button? And I, for some reason, I think you just have to train your brain. You can totally do it. You just have to train your brain to look because it's not something we just do as naturally. Yeah. My little yeah. granddaughter was um, watching YouTube kids on my phone the other day. She's she's two um, and and she just needed a little bit of downtime. So I let her look on my phone and I was what and I had some messages come in. And she was just a little finger was just swipe, swipe was getting in her way, swipe, swipe. <laughs> how do you know how to do that? They do. And it's just so <laughs> becomes so instinctive. Mm. And they don't even think about it. It's it's one of the reasons I started creating programs for women over 50, because programs I found online taught by younger people, like they just they can't even fathom what it is to be a digital immigrant. Like they don't even know what they know that we don't know. So it was a very awkward like where's the button and they're always like they're oh I'm just already doing Facebook live I'm like oh where's the button <laughs> it was like it's just right there like you should instinctively know this I'm like but I don't <laughs> I don't know it I just don't know it and it's a sensory thing as well because we're used to pressing buttons not having a screen like this where you you don't have got a physical button to press really have you it's just yeah. kind of touching a screen you know the old Blackberry yeah we don't even hang our phone up anymore like now it's like <laughs> wipe it off like kids don't even know like slamming the phone receiver down anymore <laughs> no no maybe life's poorer for that <laughs> <laughs> but yeah I think the touching thing we're very analog and very tactical you know even I remember our original remote controls for the television that had the the 30 foot cord attached to the TV that, you know, was the cord across the room and you click these big buttons. It's just, it's oh, very wow. different. Yeah, very different. I, I don't remember that, but I do remember having to get up and walk across the TV to <laughs> turn it over. <laughs> So when people come into your program, do they normally have an idea or do they just have this, this vague idea, I want to start something for myself, and they come to you to work that out? They have a vague idea. They see everybody's doing it. Everybody's doing the online thing. And so they have a vague, I want to do that too, which becomes not a challenge, but I have to do a lot of helping them see 
you know, what the whole picture really is when you have an online business, because a lot of marketers sell it as a very sexy, oh, just create a product and start making money. And I'm like, eh, not, not, not quite exactly that. There's a little thing called marketing you're going to have to do, and that's going to be your primary activity, et cetera. So some of them come with an idea. If they have an idea, more often than not, they, they're not sure if it's going to work or how it's going to work. So we kind of work on, you know, how they can niche it and formulate that. Or I have to do a lot of helping them see what they could do online because a lot of people come to me, they have been get, they have been served ads for kind of more tactical type businesses, like print on demand is a very big strategy mm -hmm. now, or there's a lot of like some of these um, MLMs or whatever they're called anymore. And they're sold, like my people come to me like, oh, I can do that because I don't have to have my own product. And I'm like, but you're going to have to market it. Like they don't see the whole picture. So I do a lot of, let's find something that comes from you, you know, deep inside you. So when you go to market it, it's something you really enjoy mm -hmm. marketing because that's, that's going to be when you have an online business, nobody talks about what you're really going to be doing is marketing. Let's talk about marketing for a moment, because that is at least 75% of, of a, a business. She says, pulling a figure out of the sky. <laughs> but it's at, <laughs> at least, at least 75, if not more. A great idea is all very well, but if you can't actually articulate what that idea is and what somebody's going to get for that and, and get and find a platform to send it out there, then you're not going to succeed. So where do you start with marketing? Yeah, well, the place I I start first is, you know, marketing is not how you're thinking about it, like from the olden days. It's not the, the used car salesman, like buy my thing, buy my thing, because we do come with that kind of preconceived notion that marketing is icky, marketing is selling, is selling, I'm bothering people. And so I have to get kind of past that with them. So I do a thing called a magazine marketing method, which was just kind of born from way back in my previous life. I was a freelance magazine writer for like Better Homes and Gardens. And so I saw how magazines work. And so I have my people say, we're going to create a magazine for your business that is becomes your marketing plan. Not that you're creating a physical magazine, but I want you to think about your business as a magazine. You have your main topic, right? Say photography, it could be your main topic. But when you pick up a magazine in the market, it's not just one topic, there's peripheral topics around that we also want to see. So I have them pull those topics out. And then I just show them, you're really just showcasing what you do, the value you do, getting people interested in the topic, but you're not beating them over the head with buy my thing, buy my thing, buy my thing. And so we get past, I think that helps them get past it. Because another thing in the online space, you said marketing 75% at least, it's also the one thing that is ongoing that you will be doing forever and ever. You can't stop because when you stop, you don't have a business. Yeah. You don't have a business. So it's the one thing that you really need to get comfortable with. And I think it can be a lot of fun, actually, if you are working, if you have a product, you know, that you really love and you're excited about, you're going to be able to talk about it much longer and with more energy and enthusiasm, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's so many ways to market now. I, I work as a brand photographer, as well as as a coach for the midlife movement, and I tend to market through conversation, really. So it'll be, I'll go on a podcast or I'll be talking to, you know, this, this is marketing, you know, on the periphery, as they call it. Yeah. It's, you know, it's not, you know, I'm not standing here saying, oh, come, come and be coached by me. And you're not saying, come and do my course on, yeah. you know, on, on yeah. being an online entrepreneur. But this is a lot of fun. And I, I need, you know, since I've turned 50, one of the things I've been determined is I'm going to have some fun in my life, not... <laughs> Absolutely. Yes, <laughs> please. Myself over the head. So there yeah. are so many more creative ideas nowadays on how to how to get your product or your service out in, into the public consciousness. It isn't just, you know, constant, as you say, buy my thing, buy my thing, buy my yeah. thing. Yeah, it's a very vulnerable thing to do. If you have created a product or a business and it comes from you, the buck stops with you. It's not like when you are in a corporate, like, oh, that was marketing. That was, you know, 
there's a lot of finger pointing when it's just your business or your thing and you're planting a flag saying, this is my thing. I'm really good at it. You should buy it. That's very vulnerable because somebody could say, that's total crap. That's awful, which they will online because of the trolls. But it's yeah. a very vulnerable position to be like, I'm really good at this and it's very valuable and you should buy it because the potential for rejection is high. And we women take that so much to heart. Yeah. I will say you can get past it with practice. Like I'm sure you have. Yeah. It's just, it takes practice. I remember back, you know, way back when I was selling programs and I would do like a webinar and I'd get to the part where I have to pitch my product and I'd be like, and then it's like, like really fast, like, okay. And just be done. Now I like say it up front, like it is this much money. We're going to talk about this. It's this much money. You know, you decide, but it it's, I think you just have to kind of you know, work on that muscle a bit. It just we takes, do. yeah, you put your yeah. big pants on and, yeah. uh, and and off you go. Yeah. yeah. Just, just talk a, a little bit about um, passive income because that's, that's the buzzword, isn't it? Around on the online space. This is totally passive income and there's no such thing as there is passive nope. income. Nope. No, there isn't. And that's one thing I have done more lately is talking a lot about the the reality, the day-to-day -day reality of having an online business. And I talk a lot about how, you know, this passive income, make money while you sleep. No, you don't. No, you don't. Or if you do get to a point where it is more passive, yeah. the work that has gone before is a lot. So in the beginning, of course, it's always more work because everything is a learning curve. Learning curves breed more learning curves. So it's kind of like, there's a tremendous amount, you know, the first time you do anything, the first time you create a product, the first time you write a marketing campaign, the first, it, it all takes time. And it's a, it's a kind of a constant experiment. Eventually the goal obviously is to get like, we are simplify your business, maybe get some automations in place some processes, but mm -hmm. it will never be all passive. The marketing it, never stops, does it? The marketing never stops. And even if you get to a point where a lot of your marketing is driven by paid advertising, you still have to watch that and monitor that and new creatives and new, you know, even if you're hiring it out in agency, which is tremendously expensive, like that's once you get, you know, mm -hmm. way up there. But no, this is something that has to be ongoing because I do talk to my, a lot of my people still work full time and they're kind of preparing for retirement and whatnot. And they're like, I just don't have time to do this. I'm like, well, you do just, you have to, the expectation needs to be a longer runway of getting things done versus if you are fully retired and can put 40 hours or whatever it is a, a week. Cause I talk about when I started my business, I had the privilege, you know, I had been canned, I'd been laid off, I'd been made redundant. So, and I had a year severance. So I had, you know, pay for a year. So I'm like, I had kind of a lot of time just to, you know, it was, it was really a privilege. But if you don't have that, you have to meet these expectations, but the expectation should never be, I'm just going to start making money in my sleep because it, it's just not going to happen. You have to, you have to run it like a business. Yeah. Otherwise it's just an expensive hobby. Expensive yeah. hobby. And it will, it's going to ebb and flow like any other industry. Like I know right now, everybody's talking about how sales are down because the economy and the world. And I'm like, you have to just ride through that. And, you know, you'll come out the other side, but it is a long-term proposition. You're never just going to make something and then make money and then you're all set. It's yeah. not. That. Yeah. Which is, I think, another reason why pick a business doing something you love that yeah. is enhancing your life. Like it's, it's bringing, it's not just a job. It's, it's doing great things for your life. Yeah. I always talk about my business. I'm like, it fills so many holes and roles in my life, like beyond money. It's community, it's learning, it's getting to travel to conferences, it's getting to meet people like you. It's like, it has filled a lot of roles. And so if you do that, then you want to keep working. I think that self-employment is one of the biggest self-discovery vehicles that you can possibly go on, self-development. And I've loved it. I've been in a position where you were saying about make sure you do something you love. When I first started out as a professional photographer, when I was 50, almost 50, I tried to do all the things and I built a quite successful wedding photography business and it was hard work and et cetera, et cetera. And I, I sat down one day and I thought, I don't actually like doing this. 
<laughs> and I'd worked so hard to build it up and all the things that I, I, I'd been told I needed to do. And I actually went on a course because I was always paying out for courses because, you know, investing in yourself and investing in your skills is also a huge thing. And I went on this course and this he was a fabulous guy. And I met him a few years later. He said, oh, you know, did it help? I said, yes, it made me realize I didn't want to do it. <laughs> Very, very valuable, actually. Knowing what you don't want to do. He was mortified. He said, oh, did I put you off? I said, no, I could see really clearly how to be really successful at this. And I thought, but I don't want to do that. I don't want to do the things that are going to make me really successful. So I pivoted and I, and I went into brand photography, which I've, I've loved over the last sort of 14 years, you know, working with, with female entrepreneurs, most of them over 40. And, and helping them to become more visible in their businesses. And I've really enjoyed that. Whereas the wedding, I love being at the wedding, but the pressure, like I didn't like it at all. It, you know, I just felt, you know, with a brand shoot, if something went wrong, you can reshoot. You can't reshoot a wedding. Oh, excuse me. Could you just kiss her again? I missed that. <laughs> <laughs> could we have some more feeling? <laughs> Yeah, it's funny you say that one of the things I do when I have my audience go through like inventories of what they could do, I'm like, the first thing you need to write down is what you do not want to do. Because mm -hmm. there's also a propensity sometimes to, to take the practical route, like, oh, I've been a bookkeeper my whole life for 40 years, I should keep doing that, that would be the practical thing to do. I'm like, but do you want to do that? If you want to do it, awesome. But knowing what you don't want to do is just as important as knowing what you do want to do. And it takes time to find it, actually. It yeah. really does. I'm knowing yourself. I like, I loved photography. I'm behind a camera. I'm actually quite a shy person. I like one-to-one -one or one-to-two. I don't like big crowds and big groups. And although I will stand on a stage and speak, that's quite anonymous in a way. But yes. mm -hmm. my first wedding... <laughs> I went to do the group shot, climbed onto a wall and said, everybody, look at me. And I went, who? Because everybody turned. Everybody looked at you. Yeah. <laughs> everybody looked at you. What I thought I was going to be doing. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Yeah, but when you talk about self-development, I, I talk about that in my audience. Like if you want to get to know yourself and go through like self-therapy, start a business because you will uncover yeah. every doubt, every, you know, Every insecurity, everything is just going to bubble right up to the top. I'm like, Tony Robbins has nothing on self-development. Like start a business. So start a business and really get to know yourself. You get to know and, yourself. Yeah. And also don't be afraid that, you know, a failure because failure is just a step towards success. So you might start something. I mean, I, I started a fairy photography business and I love doing it, but it didn't succeed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. I stopped doing it, you know, and, and, and did something else, but you put a lot of energy into things and, and know, knowing when it's not working and you need to let go and, and sort of pivot. And it's the yes. pivoting because you've learned so much in that, that, that you're going to take to the next thing and not being afraid of that failure, I think is, is a huge yeah. skill to have as a self-employed person. Yes. And I think when you, when you bring it online, the one of the great things is the opportunity to pivot is very I don't want to say easy. It's simple. It's not like if you have an on-ground business, you know, you have a retail shop or something, you don't, you don't just suddenly turn it from this to this, you know, there's not, there's no pivoting in the online space. It's fairly easy. Like you said, to transfer your skills, maybe to a different niche or just a different Avenue or whatever it happens to be. And everything you've done before is just building up to that. Like it's not for, it's not wasted at all. You're just kind of learning as you go. Yeah. And I don't know that I know any entrepreneurs, like in my circle, like I've been in a mastermind for four years that if somebody says, oh, I started, you know, 10 years ago, they're not doing the same thing no. that they're doing now. So it's very common and very accepted and almost encouraged to pivot in the online space, which is wonderful. So here I am then, if we imagine I'm, I'm a woman in her fifties wanting to build an online business, have, have an agile business that I can build around the lifestyle that I want to have. And I'm going to come to you and say, Colleen, I'm not quite sure what I'm going to do, but I want to start building this business while I'm still working. What happens next? I have them start with their inventories, you know, exactly what we're going to dig into your interests, your skills, your passions. And it's beyond what did you study in school, those types of things. I take them to a lot of like journal, kind of journaling 
things like, you know, what are you known for in your circle of people? Like, oh, you know, oh, Joe, she's the, she's the photographer, give her the camera or, oh, she's the techie one. We're all known for something. So uncovering those things, what do people ask you to do all the time? Just because you're really good at it. Because I like to uncover what I call the hidden skills that you don't see it as a skill, but are there. I've had so many women say, I could do that. I'm like, yeah, you could totally do that as a business. But it's really about, you know, I have them really journal and inventory everything that they're good at, everything that they're, you know, skilled at in terms of like officially skilled degrees, that kind of certifications. But then we dig much deeper into what are you really good at? Because you've taken on a lot of things. And then really looking at which of those do you think would light you up? Like what gets you excited and kind of removing the, removing the part like, oh, is that practical? Could I do that? I'm like, we're not going to even look at that. Now I want you to look at what would get you most excited about a business and start from that. And then we'll figure out how to monetize that. That's always the, like one of the first things I do. Another thing I do is have the women really look at what are your goals? What what is the purpose of this business? Like what role do you want it to play in your life? Because that's going to determine a lot of things. If you want, if you want to make an extra thousand dollars a month, that's a very different business than if you want to make 10,000 a month. And so we look at, you know, really like what, and I'm like, you just, de you define your success, but I want you to define what that looks like up front. So, you know, so I have them go, beyond the money as well. But you know, what time do you have to commit to this? Like literally, like what time do you have one day a week? Do you have seven days a week? Do you have 20 hours a week? Just kind of getting very tactical with things like that. I also have them look at, obviously life happens. We can't plan for it, but is anything planned? Like I've had people come in my world like, well, we're getting ready to sell our house and downsize. I'm like, probably not a good time to start a business right now. If you're going to be moving in the next three months or whatever. So like try to account for life events, that type of thing. Get a clear picture of the reality of having a business and how long do you want to be in this business? Is this something you would have, been, you know, want for two years, five years? Do you, do you need it to be, you know, really flexible that you take three months off? Like you're going RVing across Europe every summer or something that, that you don't want to work or can you take your work with you? To really look at it, because I've seen a lot of people build businesses, they wind up hating because it doesn't, it just becomes a job and it takes over their life. So that's where I start the inventories and just getting a really clear picture about what their goals are for this business beyond just money. Money's important. Uh, we all love making money, but there has to be more kind of parameters set around it. So then your expectations can be managed about how long is this going to take to get going? How, how long do I have to commit to this? There's this notion in the online business, like this passive income, like that you're not going to actually have to show up. I'm like, no, no, we need to know Monday morning. What, what do you do Monday morning? What do you do Tuesday afternoon? We have to create a structure around it. So I get, I do a lot of, I don't know, just discussion around the reality of the business. And I always say it's 100% doable, but you need to define what your success looks like first versus you know, all the crap we see online, like, oh, you're going to make 10,000 a month, or you're going to have a six figure launch, you know, all the, you know, bullshit marketing that we see. It's like, yeah, that's where I start them. Yeah. Yes, it's hard work. Yes, it's, it can be heartbreaking. Sometimes it can be exhausting. But it's also the most exhilarating and exciting thing to take your own future into your own hands, and to work for yourself. And particularly on the, in the online space, where you don't have to physically be in one place, um, every day, except for maybe on your laptop, but that can be anywhere. <laughs> exactly. It is. It is hard work and it is a thousand percent worth it. 100%. Yeah. Just check your maths there. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming and sharing all of that with us, Colleen. What's the name of your program? Uh, my program is called Pilot to Profit. And I also have a weekly newsletter called the Gumption Gazette. So we'll put, we'll put the links in there for that. Awesome. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.